Um, so um, thanks for um, thanks for coming. I hope um, of I, I'm curious how many people are like coming to the Northeast Media Literacy Conference this Friday and Saturday. You better be Pam or else. Oh, that's so great. Great. Well, there's still time to sign up. Um, registration ends on Wednesday. So um, so we chose this um, or we wrote Sam and Mike, Michael into um, allowing this book to be the um, media club selection for this month because Whitney Phillips, um, the co-author of You Are Here, is the keynote speaker at the Northeast Media Literacy Conference on Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern and um, Eastern Standard Time. And actually, I was just emailing with her about her talk. Pam, I'll forward that to you so you know what she has in mind. Um, so, um, so Whitney Phillips is a professor at um, Syracuse University in the Department of Communication and Rhetorical Studies. Um, I would say that she, um, like, her first initial big piece of research was um, a data and society report called the Oxygen of Amplification, um, which um, kind of it took the 2016 US election as a starting point and to explore um, the how the work of journalists can inadvertently amplify um, hateful um, and uh, you know toxic uh, corners of society. Um, it's a really interesting report. Um, and actually chapter three of, of this book kind of builds on or borrows from from that report. So um, you can check out, that's free online. Um, but um, I know that we said uh, to folk for this conversation, um, if you only have time to read a couple of chapters, the introduction and the final chapter, chapter six would be a good place to start. Um, the introduction kind of late, <laughs> gives a lay of the land of this book, which is about getting a lay of the land um, on, of, the internet or online communication spaces. Um, and then chapter six kind of um, lays out um, some, some principles to guide this like ecological liter literacy approach to media literacy. So Pam and I have put together um, a list of I, I hope, I think are interesting discussion questions. Um, and I wonder, maybe we can start with the first one, Pam. I kind of yeah, we, we can uh, we can tag team. Yeah. So, um, uh, for those who maybe read some of the introduction or not, um, just to so the first question um, asking, I'm curious to hear from you all what you see as the most surprising or like the key moments um, in the book's historical lay of the land. So. The book kind of touches on various um, uh, various points, from, like the satanic panics in the 70s and 80s to the rise of um, evangelical um, right-wing media in the 70s and 80s as well. Um, and then talks about early internet culture in the mid 2000s or aughts, mid aughts, I guess you call them. Um, and, then the, and then transitions to the 2016 election and then Donald Trump's Twitter feed. Um, and so I'm curious to start, like, what do you see as in within that lay of the land? Like, what do you see as the most important moments to explain, like, where, why we're at, where we're at with the um, polluted information environment that we have? Um, and then maybe what's left out? Like, what would you include in, um, in a, a similar historical lay of the land? Yeah, I mean, especially since it was, for the most part, a pretty American um, perspective. Yes. So for those of you coming from other countries, you may be able to add your own. Can I go? Please. Hi, go so ahead. I read this, hi, um, I read this really interesting article um, while I think it was a uh, time for election in France, so I think my people probably Jinmen, uh, <laughs> brother wants to say something to you. <laughs> Relatable. Uh, 
<laughs> Classic barking dog. Every Zoom has to have one. <laughs> okay. So the subject is about the rise of the right um, all over the world. And um, this sort of uh, started, I think, early on uh, in India, where we... <laughs> where we um, saw, um, you know, this, this rise of fascist powers, um, which said that, you know, you have to be here for India, you have to make in India, um, you know, the, the West is good as long as you're exporting and things like those. And I think I started, like, the article sort of brought in view those patterns um, in the USA, of course, um, and then they sort of zoomed into an analysis of uh, you know, the, the politics of Macron and uh, Marie Le Pen. So um, I think all of these things sort of, um, they sort of circular for me. They're um, pockets of different parts of the world um, start to feel that uh, there's too much of fascism, too much of nationalism, so we need to go towards excuse me, socialism, and then it's you know, all over again. There's too much of socialism, too much of charity. Uh, what about my country? What about my people? Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, I'm really curious um, about what people feel about and think about the ecological metaphor in general. Like, does it, you know, the using that ecological metaphor, starting with that story um, about uh, Whitney running through the hills in California next to the ocean and carrying it forward um, from there, does it work for you? And is it a good metaphor that you might want to use? Carolyn. Yes. I found that that really spoke to me. I'm a writer for an online magazine that looks at clean tech. And I found that that metaphor is really something that personalizes and makes local the crises that we have in our world around the climate, but also demonstrates, at least at a beginning place, how the digital world has exacerbated the climate crisis because there is so much disbelief. And for those of you who haven't been able to sit in on all the media clubs, Sam, am I right? We had an algorithm discussion on this and it was really interesting in that it talked about one of the reasons and so does Phillips talk here that there's so much polarization. She talks about that in the introduction is because Social media was not as uh, popular, nor did the algorithms target particular individuals to the point where four clicks later, you could be at a very scary place after the 2016 election. So I thought the metaphors really brought together the two worlds very well. It could be my area of interest as well, but I really enjoyed it because of that. Salome, did you have your hand up? Actually not. I just oh. found that I have Yanti's account into my Zoom and I'm like, what's going on? I'm not Yanti. So I need to figure out to sign out right. <laughs> and then uh, I'm going to rejoin, okay? Just to yeah, avoid sure. any interruption with his um, meeting. Sure. So sorry. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Michael. Uh, actually, it spoke a lot to me, not the, the guy who's charming at the beginning, so I didn't like him reading that stuff, so I crossed it out. <laughs> but I really like the metaphor. I think the metaphor works very well for me. Um, like, especially when we think about like this, I really liked also the term network pollution, um, because I have the feeling that there's lots of toxic information and uh, lots of misinformation, whatever you want to call it, and, and disinformation, malinformation. It's all like floating around there on the internet and it's really getting like a, um, there's so much trash out there we are uploading so much uh, stuff on uh, onto the internet every day so for me it's in a way um, it was a very good metaphor and it worked uh, quite well actually so I, I was very pleased actually about that so and it helped me also like to 
it, it opened in a way also somehow um, ideas because I have the feeling that the pollution, like the information flow, it's almost reminding me of water like that's flowing like just everywhere. So it's just, and um, so it was very, so I really like that, so. Can you see yourself using it um, in any context, Michael? Of course, yeah, I, I see it right away. I liked also the idea that it's going up like on the level of, mm, that it's um, somehow at the thing that it's above like the term misinformation, which has like a connotation and network pollution at the thing that it's, it's more like first the observation, right? The feeling. And then you would say, is it misinformation? What's the motivation behind that pollution? Is it intended, not intended, these things? So I, I thought I would, I, I see myself using it, yes. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I, th I thought it was interesting that they conflated the, um, the misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation um, into that one category. Um, because it, I think it is confusing to people and you kind of always have to explain what the three terms mean. And so this kind of gives that more general. Who did I interrupt? And Somebody could I just add as a follow up to Michael that the authors um, remove motivation as a primary mechanism. They say that it's not enough to say, I meant this. If you did it, like the people who did the memes and it ended up taking on a life they never expected, they're still responsible, they're complicit. And I thought that's an important point to make because we often excuse ourselves saying, I didn't know. They don't, these authors don't give us that out. Yeah, this is a really, really important point, Carolyn. Thank you so much for bringing it up. Um, it turns out that it's impossible to know a communicator's intent. So even while in media literacy, we ask what's the author's purpose? Ultimately, the author's purpose is unknowable and artists will tell you it's even unknowable to themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So, but the reason why that is so, so important and certainly it's important to the study of propaganda is because I might design something and my purpose is to entertain or to inform, but when you see it, you recognize its persuasive intent. You recognize its function as propaganda. So it doesn't need to be intended to be propaganda to function as propaganda. And removing intent actually does create more opportunity for us to think about harms. And I feel like that's something that the authors do really well in the final chapter of the book is they talk a little bit about how we have to have a much more uh, expansive and detailed understanding of harm uh, in order to move forward with an analyzing problematic information. Yeah, I, Renee, I don't know if this is what you're getting at when you said that the author doesn't sometimes know their own motivation, but think about how many people are posting things with an ideology in mind and don't really understand that they are you know, posting through a lens or they're being influenced themselves and that just kind of snowballs. Yeah, I found the, uh, that whole chapter about the deep mimetic frames really, um, really interesting. Um, when, I, when I was writing my uh, dissertation a few years ago, I was just becoming familiar with this idea of, of an ecological view of, of media and and I kept thinking as I was reading this like how valuable this book would have been for me three years ago because the I was thinking about it in terms of how certain um, media tools kind of sometimes coalesce and influence other media tools and the, in the ways that we use them and and yet in this book they take this uh, the approach gets the, this ecological metaphor is is expanded so much to think not just about how some innov innovations and uses influence other innovations and uses, but it also allows us to think about the difference between the individual and the community, how various people are looking be, uh, through these frames and how difficult it is to see your own frame. Um, uh, the, the idea of positive and negative uh, freedoms, like all thinking about ecology uh, or media as, as, as an ecological system just opens it up to view so many different influencing factors of, of misinformation, of, of information disorder, as they say. And, um, and I thought this really kind of was, especially as it led into the conclusion, how it, 
you know, in, in their response and what we can do about the situation, it led to a lot of uh, good discussion about, you know, how, how, like, how we can address it by looking at all these different elements, like uh, looking at it both as an individual um, and then also about as a person in a, in a, in a, a much larger geographical space or community. Yeah, I um, I am so fascinated by um, an anecdote in the like in the very first pages where they're in Brazil at a conference and and they find out that um, what do they say that these um, these things that are not indigenous to Brazilian politics these things like gun rights, free speech, uh, attacks against political correctness, but these like kind of U.S like talking points or like these things that we really like wrestle with and fight with each other in the US about have infiltrated Brazilian politics through memes or, you know, internet communication spaces and just how like, that's, that was just like so mind blowing to me and like how complicated then. So then in Brazil, how do you untangle that? How do you, how do you analyze that? How do you address that? And, and like, what, how do you move on from that? And, and how it's like, the way that our actions, there's so many unintended impacts that it's not just like it's very local and then it's the communities that we know are a part of, but then it's like these very far reaching impacts that like culturally we're all like intermingling with each other in these ways that are kind of unknowable. And correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, uh, it was my understanding that Steve Bannon actually was a part of the Bolsonaro campaign as an advisor and Modi in, in India as well, and introduced a lot of those um, topics that they found were resonated and pushed buttons for citizens. And then the meme network can just take over from there once, once it's introduced. I find the whole um, uh, metaphor, you know, I think any of us in media literacy have had the experience of needing to explain what it is over and over again. So I, I really, especially since my work was mostly in the K through 12, um, K, K to 12 uh, education realm, um, that metaphors and stories really resonated with my audience. Like that is something they could hold on to even if media literacy was too big of a concept or too complicated of a concept or too big of a concept. Um, I just saw one um, that the European EAVI, I can't remember what it stands for. Michael, you might know. Uh, anyway, they produced this little video with a little boy getting on a boat and and he they use the ocean, an oceanic voyage as their metaphor. And he's, uh, you know, attacked by pirates and he he thinks someone's hand is is needing a help out of the water and it's an octopus that's going to pull him down. Like, I just think that for especially if we're talking about introducing this to um all audiences that metaphors are a great way to do it. I'm wondering if any of you have used other metaphors. I, I know I have used a media diet uh, because the US especially is so health conscious that everybody gets, you know, what you put into your body makes um, a difference as to how healthy you are. And so I've used that to be like what you put into your mind um, via the media that you consume uh, has the same either positive or negative effect. Anybody else have other metaphors that they've used? Okay, let's keep thinking I, about well, it. Well, I can think of, it's, it's indirect, but as I think I told some of you if you were here last time, I, pr I focus primarily on showing interesting, challenging, great films of all kinds. But I'm constantly thinking that my goals are similar to yours in the sense that I am trying to get students to think about multiple perspectives. And earlier when a couple of you were talking about how you you mistrust intent as a way to judge, I've, I've come to that conclusion myself because 
movies are made by so many people for so many purposes that I don't think, despite the French theory of literature, I don't think you can say, here's the intent of the movie, but you can talk about perspectives. So in that sense, it's, I don't know if you'd call that a metaphor, but I'm, I'm constantly saying, okay, and now how does this apply to advertising or politics or what you see on the internet? You know, trying to, trying to build from their enthusiasm about movies to engage them in thinking about other forms of media. Mm. Kathy, I saw you had your hand up. Um, yeah, I just put it in the chat there, but Davina mentioned infodemic and I don't, again, I'm not sure if it's technically a metaphor, but it comes from that idea of infodemic. And um, so I was just thinking of that term as well. Yeah, great, thanks. This is kind of a simplistic metaphor, but one thing um, in this, in the first chapter about the satanic panics, um, they talk about, I think it was, I can't remember if it was there in the conclusion, where it talks about one of the, um, ways we can address this is by understanding the limitations and uh, um, of, of the platforms that we're using. Um, you know, what are the functions of a like button, of, of a like button, uh, how does stuff show up in our feed? Um, you know, how many characters are we allowed to type in? And this is a really simple, simple uh, simplistic metaphor that I use with my students a lot. Um, and there's some problems with it. But one thing I always talk about is like, if when you have a specific task you need to accomplish, say I need to build a chicken coop, which I've done recently, like I have a, a hammer that, that serves a couple specific functions. I can put a nail in, I can take a nail out, I can maybe pry something, but I know what that tool can be used for um, before I go into it, just like I know a drill allows me to use some, it gives me some different capabilities. And so I tell them to think about like when they're on their devices, to think about the tool as not just uh, um, the platforms, Twitter, Snapchat, not just as places to linger, but as, as places to perform tasks, places to gather information and, and to think about the limitations of that information spread uh, and what the different functions of those things are. And so just think about it as just like you would any sort of like handheld building tool that has limitations and and um, what is the opposite set of limitations has possibilities. So, mm. Affordances. Yeah. 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 Affordances, which is what yeah. she talked about in the final chapter. And it, I went to that section on um, she write, they write um, we have to work harder to not allow the tool to use to restrict our site. Um, and to, speaking to what you were just saying, like, yeah, you have to understand how the tools work and that they like funnel you towards certain actions or noticing certain things. You know, uh, Marshall McLuhan said, we shape our tools and then they shape us. Hmm. And another metaphor, Jason, when you mentioned the function of the like button, I, re I remembered that occasionally I'll have a conversation with students in which I say, act towards each other right now the way you do online. So when people say things, they say, I like that. Oh, I don't like that. You know, that, that kind, you know, to, to translate that into real life, I guess that's a metaphor. Yeah, yeah, you get three options. You can respond to every comment with like, dislike, or angry face. Right, right, <laughs> or care. Yeah, you could have, you could have hold up paddles with right, <laughs> different right. emojis. <laughs> you know, but that's one thing. It's funny that that this conversation led there because that's usually the reaction that uh, my students move towards is how simplistic, how how like in order to have that conversation, you have to eliminate all nuance, mm. uh, and you are you are not allowed to recognize nuance. You're allowed to say I like this, and you're allowed to express it in 180 characters or, or whatever it is. Um, you know, so it's it, it there is that. Now, I mean, I think like. They when I said like the metaphor is problematic, it's that these tools aren't simply just kind of objective tools. Like there are things behind these tools that are working to, to, to influence us and get us to do certain things. Um, so there are more complicated, but I think for a basic in understanding of it, it is, it is useful. Yeah, and in that space, I, I really like how you outlined, Jason, how like it's a really simplistic message, right? It's very like condensed and there's no nuance to it. And yet we all feel like that we have to respond as though, you know, our entire nuance is relevant and we're bringing all of that with us when really it's not coming with us. It's just becoming, it's, yeah. Um, one thing that, um, I'm, I also, I work in K-12, I work in a high school, um, 
and some like a very predominant message um, in like internet safety or like digital citizenship curriculum is about individual responsibility. Like you um, like be careful what you post, be careful how you respond to things. It's very much like it is your responsibility to act right online. And I um, I appreciated speaking of nuance, I, what I what I would describe as a more nuanced perspective on individual responsibility that's kind of explored a bit in this book. Um, and she like they they write um, it's not don't feed the trolls in that like well if the trolls come after you it's your fault because you responded and you're you're um, you're egging them on or you're giving them what they want but it's more the communitarian aspect of what how does this impact communities if I amplify this message or whatnot. And I'm wondering if anyone also thinks about individual responsibilities online or um, like what's the, how do you think about that? Whether, you know, you talk to students about it or you think about it yourself, like what is, what are the responsibilities of us as individuals versus um, things are too complicated for us as individuals to truly take responsibility for? I think it's one part, it's like one piece of the, the whole game, I guess. Um, so you can always like look at the individual actor, but then looking like maybe more at the field of media today. So of course you have different actors here, like the, the state, for example, you have like the, the companies, like the tech companies, uh, what they are doing. Um, so, and I remember like, um, I think it was Gina, she was saying nothing works in, in silo, everything is somehow uh, if something wants to should work, you have to partner up with some other people or other actors or institutions. So I believe right here it's the same thing. So I believe, of course, that you have to empower the individual, the agency right here. But I believe as well that in the tech companies, they have to, to do something right here in the state as well. Um, in France, you have like a law since 2018 about misinformation. If it's applied or not, that's another thing. Um, but that's like the state where it's somehow like like, uh, like a law is put forward. Um, I think like also uh, Mark Zuckerberg, even so he's a kind of a contested figure in the field. He was talking about the Holocaust denials like recently, I think like two weeks ago where he was saying that he's actually trying to limit that. So again, there's these different actors they have to to come into the game and probably gonna have to think maybe even like the technology itself I don't, I don't know i'm thinking out loud maybe the technology itself that there should be maybe kind of a, a limitation maybe i don't know i don't know how to say that it was just a, a thought mm -hmm. no i i think it's an important one and it's why um uh we've invited um my one of the four congressional um, representatives from Rhode Island to come to our final session uh, at the conference this weekend uh, to talk about government's response in regards to media. And he, um, he is the head of uh, the committee that oversees like social media uh, uh, regulation. Um, so, and has been, and apparently uh, because of the report that they put out, um, that was the basis for the recent action um, against uh, Google um, that that is being brought uh, about the um, the the consolidation of power um, and and how that just grows and grows uh, on, on the and in social media and on on the internet. Uh, so you know, I, I wanted him to hear other people <laughs> and other and media literacy people and get to know it even more than my voice in his ear. Um, but um, yeah, and we, uh, we've we also invited Amy Klobuchar. I think she might be busy the weekend after the, the uh, election, but we've invited her because she's introduced a bill for media literacy education here in the United States. And um, we feel as though our community needs to learn about that and how we can support it. So I think the government regulation and, and support piece is huge, Michael. Thank you for bringing it up. You know, and, and kind of on, 
an overlap to that. You know, one of the quotes in the introductory um, chapter that got uh, that got my attention was, "We all fit within a complex tangle of ideological, social, and technological connections." knowing where we're standing in relation to all those other forces and all those other people allows us to better understand the consequences of sharing and even simply being in our networked environments. Most important of all, a you are here triangulation, triangulation reveals how our individual me entwines with a much larger we and how the fates of both are connected. So that just really made me start wondering about mapping ourselves. You know, how do we map ourselves onto the, you know, in that triangular, it just reminded me of a lot of, I, I think of a lot of the psychological maps that um, you know were introduced to me in my undergraduate de degree that that were really helpful in understanding where you were in the psychological realm of your family or of society or whoever was impacting your life and that one made me just think about that like how do we physicalize or graph you know that kind of uh, of a where we are well and to that to that like that's another like element like nuance that I appreciate um because again in like k 12 online safety digital citizenship curriculum there's certainly there's certainly times we talk about social emotional health but it's in a like cyberbullying way where it's like don't be mean online but I really appreciate and as represented in that quote that you just read Pam how this kind of it it's recognizing that there is definitely a social emotional impact of our life online and our social emotional health impacts how we show up online, but it isn't such a simple like, well, just don't be mean. And no, it's like, think about where, where you are, your trip, like how you, how you fit into the larger ecosystem. Like it's just, it's so complicated, but, um, but it's not disconnected from ways that we think about other, as, as you say, like these psychological maps. It's not, it's not this totally new way of thinking about things necessarily. Carolyn. Um, Pam was reading from the introduction and there's an additional line that I think is important for this conversation. It says, it's the difference between asserting that an individual has the right to spew whatever poison they want without restraint and asserting that those within the collective have the right not to be poisoned. And I think it's a place where the metaphor is a little weaker here to suggest the environmental and digital worlds have commonality because there's often a suggestion that we should look at our carbon footprint. And I have looked at my carbon footprints, which is not the discussion for today, but the Sunrise Movement of Youth argues that looking at our individual carbon footprints takes away from the onus of the fossil fuel companies and how they are regulating the way we use energy. And it's a hard argument to... Um, to stand up against. So I'm not sure these authors made enough of a case for me how I as an individual can work to make more transparent the pollution of what is their area of expertise, the digital world. Part mm -hmm. of my difficulty too is that I'm much older, I think, than the audience for this book. And I don't really get mimetic frames. So if somebody could help me with that, because my social media use, I'm sure, is a lot less than many of you out there. If I could throw that out. Yeah, you know, what, what you just said about the, you know, the poisoning and the being poisoned, it just made me think in terms of the arguments that are happening around here about mask wearing, you know, like, my right to not wear a mask. 
Um, but where does that intersect with your, your, you know, other people's right not to be infected by you if you might be carrying the virus? And, and some of the arguments I've seen are great. Like, you know, it used to be your right to smoke anywhere you wanted to smoke. But once the data was in about how harmful the smoke in inhalation was, it, you know, you could still smoke, but we really regulated the places where you could smoke, uh, which was not in any public place anymore. So that's, you know, that's one kind of environmental argument that could be made. Uh, Xian, I did you have your hand up a while ago? Yeah, indeed. Uh, I just want to share a little bit of my thoughts about uh, the agency issue of like uh, like the individual responsibility based on my own research. So uh, because my research is basically uh, focusing on how uh, people d uh, dig up all the dirt of other people in the past, uh, and then they will use them as a weapon to uh, target and to kind of attack um, these people. Um, based on various reasons. It might be political, it might be uh, just emotional. So what I want to say is that uh, in my view, the individual responsibility is really, how to say, um, individuals cannot really control how their informations, how their opinions are being used. And a lot of the times these informations are taken out of the contexts. Um, this is uh, basically because the social media kind of like, um, lead to this uh, context collapse for um, various perspectives of our lives. And um, I also kind of like, uh, the, the metaphor also resonated with me when it says that um, this kind of like pollution disregard, uh, disregards the borders. So that kind of like resonate, uh, resonate with me in terms of um, a lot of this um, information, text, opinions posted by individuals um, they are taken out of the borders. They are not used in the context they're intended to. So um, yeah, that's my view on the um, agency issues. I don't think it's uh, really possible for individuals to be uh, to be to take responsible uh, responsibility of what they're uh, really posting online. Michelle, that seems like a good segue into your um, your quote about uh, Phillips and Milner's um, taking res their own responsibility for their own research. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so in chapter two, I think it is, um, of the book, um, they talk about early internet, like internet culture in the mid-aughts um, and kind of trace how um, uh, like the culture of, you know, internet culture, um, what seemed fun back then and just kind of like ironic and, you know, just joke about anything, anything goes on the internet, how some of the roots of like what's toxic today has roots in that culture that breed back then. Um, and it's very, I actually was introduced to Winnie Phillips' work by um, an essay that she wrote that she really gets personal about how as an early researcher, she um, she can recognize how she contributed to that, how she would write, um, she did research on troll communities in 4chan and how she kind of like a, um, uncritically wrote about that world. And, and, she, and, and Milner says he did too. Um, his dissertation was on memes and he just wrote about these horrific memes that but like free of context and just talked about like the rhetorical devices these memes use without really reckoning with the fact that, um, you know, they were like Holocaust denying memes or whatever, like that was the joke. Um, and so they're, they get very personal, I think in chapter two and really talk about how their early research, they can, they can see how they ne negatively contributed um, in the early days. Um, and I was, I'm just really struck by that. And I wonder, um, you know, how can research, education, journalism, how can um, these things contribute negatively perhaps to culture and society in ways that are totally unintended? And I wonder if anyone can think, um, if anyone wants to reflect personally and you know, I'm sure no one here has done anything um, truly harmful, but if there's anything, you know, the way that you should teach about 
used to, used to teach about something in the past or whatever, if you look back and you think, um, actually that was like, that was training people to, to focus on the wrong things or, or whatever. Um, if anyone has any thoughts on any of that. What comes to mind to me is just um, like responses to misinformation more than, um, you know, experience of, of like maybe intentionally spreading or teaching bad habits. Uh, <clears throat> and because they talk a lot about, I think it's a, a really interesting approach in the final chapter where when they discuss, you know, what can we do to, to help this problem? Um, you know, they, they kind of take the sense that you know like fact checking for example is not always the appropriate response and sometimes it can further entrench people in their ideologies um and then also you know there's they they stay very open-ended on this they provide a lot of solutions but that always ends with this solution is probably not always the right response i mean and, and i think like sometimes it's trying to in order to help people see beyond their mimetic frames to try to um, you know, present alternative narratives, which was um, mentioned earlier. Another point it's, it was um, to help people is to try to describe, uh, you know, how the how this misinformation can spread and try to help them understand that the whole processes of communication spread and how you can be misled easily and what happens when you share that information. And um, it, it kind of left me on one hand i really liked the the how multifaceted the approach was to um addressing the issue but on the other hand it also um felt really i don't I think unstable isn't isn't really the right word but there were just it was hard to tell which was the right solution in which situation and um again like when you're responding to a lot of these these instances of misinformation or malinformation or disinformation um, you're also subject to the device that the information was spread on. So you're subject to their own sort of limitations and affordances. So. Yeah, so I mean, if I, I'll, ref I'll reflect on the state that I made in the past. I, um, when I taught, in middle school, I, I would just like tell kids to use certain digital tools. And if they questions like, well, why this tool or something, I, I would just kind of brush it off and I'd be like, because I found out about a conference, I think it's a really good tool. So you're going to use it. Um, and you know, that's like, I realized now I just, even, even if I had done my homework and like really determined that that was a good tool, just thinking about the, like the lack of deliberation that I offered or you know and that's just like training the exact wrong thing that we want users in a digital world to think about to like truly um I don't know to truly feel like you have control over like what you engage with and in um but that's hard but then you know if like if I to do that it's like it's all um you know uh so opening up a can of worms perhaps and then like my lesson plan derails because all these students are rebelling and saying I'm not using that tool. Um, so I, I, yeah, reflecting on like where to, I don't know, where to open up the conversation and then where to be like, ah, oh, we have to use that, sorry. And I think that's just a real, you know, a reality of being an educator and hopefully being open to challenge and criticism. I, I just heard on the radio in the car yesterday in Rhode Island, we have a Rhode Island version of the national NPRs, This I Believe. And the one that I heard yesterday was written by a middle school student who felt uncomfortable when her uh, teacher, um, not, not when she introduced the land, the native land that uh, we live on here um, but then started playing a drum and, and singing an Indian chant. And she just felt as though that was cultural appropriation and was nervous about approaching her teacher about it. Um, and uh, I think that with media, especially um, older high school students uh, are, and middle school students are really sensitive in this area because they really feel as though their students know 
so much more than they do about the media environment. And in my workshops with them, I always say the line, they may know how to push buttons better than you do, but they don't know necessarily how their buttons are being pushed. And that's where you come in as an educator to teach critical analysis skills. That's what media literacy is all about. We are getting um, close to the end. So uh, I- How about your last question, Pam? I like that. Question. Yeah, so I just wanted to uh, mentioned that, uh, you know, it happened totally by accident because, you know, we were still thinking about an in-person uh, conference when we invited uh, Whitney Phillips, who is local, to, to come down from Boston to, or Syracuse to, to Providence to, um, you know, to be our keynote speaker. But uh, Phillips and Milner's book title, You Are Here, became the perfect way to start a conference whose working title, and now the title of our final session is, where do we go from here? So, you know, I guess my last question is, how does the book and its metaphor provide us with some idea of how to get out of the media mess that we're currently in? It's a big question, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's a big uh, cleanup to do, right? <laughs> yeah, there's a big cleanup, yeah. <laughs> yeah, on both counts, you know. But, you know, and it was, I'll tell you, it was funny. Just today um, in the, uh, the road trip, which is the Boston Globe um, attempt to infiltrate the Rhode Island uh, market uh, because our own paper of record here is, has been so co-opted. Um, they gave some data about uh, this great research about what states saw as their top two issues, critical issues um, for this election uh, and this, uh, this time. And Rhode Island was one of only four states that had uh, climate change in mm -hmm. its top two. COVID was one and COVID was in most of the states and climate change was in two, only in Rhode Island, Alaska, California, and Oregon. And I just thought, yay for us, you know? Yeah. <laughs> because they're both about survival, you know? Um, and, and even though the other uh, issues that were of paramount importance to other states, like racism, and, you know, systemic racism and healthcare, are important. It's like if we don't deal with these huge environmental issues, we're not going to be around to deal with those other ones. So that's, uh, I guess I voted in that. <laughs> anyway, uh, any, any last uh, thoughts? I'm going to just add something. I haven't read the whole book yet. I started with introduction and I love the idea of comparing media environment to the like natural environment we live. So that's, I'm, I'm there. I'm a big fan of this book already, even though I just had uh, a glimpse of introduction. Uh, but what I think that I also had this question, I think we will have trouble as a whole society and government and industries to uh, label um, problems that are coming from technologies as an existential problem, as a problem that is almost like uh, climate change, right? So I don't think that everybody will agree on that, that this is a big problem. Um, this is kind of my pessimistic uh, thought that I had while I was reading this introduction. And this might be also an answer to your question, how where are we, where we go from here. I think we have individual responsibility, but we also need to have collective um, agreement. And this is not about the social agreement. This is more like political and strong agreements that mm -hmm. there are some threats coming from these big industries, big technologies that we need to, um, I don't know, we need to be, keep in mind and do something. 
So we need more agency and agreement on that this is a threat. But maybe here yeah. that might be actually the metaphor helpful, like when you think about ecology today and how ecology evolved like 20, 30 years ago, at least in Europe, and how ecology or like activists right here trying to find answers to the pollution. Maybe that could be like a kind of indoors and maybe could give ideas how to control or like to, to deal with this kind of network pollution. Because I remember as well, for example, the, the fact that many times society is used as a lab. So people are throwing like new technology into the society. And maybe some people were at the time then saying before we throw in things into society like new technology, maybe there should be kind of a, a more democratic way of looking at these technologies and how they're gonna be applied. And maybe that could be, I think they have done that in, uh, in ecology. And maybe that could be also a way like to be applied maybe to the media world today. I don't know. It's mm -hmm. like a thought that I... Yeah, I think it's it's pretty much a, a you know, a historical tr trend that science uh, and technology run faster than the morality of the use of that technology or scientific advancement. Um, so it's where we are. Well, and also like, it's not just a technology problem. It's like a, it's a political problem that um, we have to contend yeah. with. That Davina had, you had your hand up. Um, I don't know if you still wanna say the thing you wanted to say then. You'd need to unmute Davina if you wanna jump in. I'm sorry, you stuck. Um, so actually, Salome sort of covered covered the point very well. Um, you know that we need sometimes there's too much of responsibility, too much of burden. Um, that is sort of deemed on the individual's shoulders, and we really need um, like a constant effort, a collective effort. Um, which is guided uh, because there are so many issues in the polarization, uh, you know, and the echo chambers. I mean, if I <clears throat> believe in something, um, I will find, um, you know, through confirmation bias, uh, conspiracy theories or fake news or even real news, which sort of just helps me dig into my existing uh, biases. So, um, yeah. There's, there's a lot of trash, as Michael was mentioning. Yeah, I think that's a good place to wrap up, that it is definitely just like, you know, our, our environmental crisis, it's going to take a multi-pronged approach to, you know, to really start turning the tide around this. So it's, which is a big part of why we wanted to expand the conference this weekend to include journalists and civics educators and like more librarians, you know, not just the media literacy uh, community so that we could have cross uh, disciplinary uh, conversations about this and learn how to support each other's efforts, which is what that last session is gonna be all about. Um, so looking forward to seeing you all oh. then. How and long, there? Um, do you actually have the link for the conference maybe to share with everybody? I'll bet Michelle can find it and pop it in very quickly. Oh, very big. Um, um, yeah. Still uh, register. And for anybody here, if um, it, it's only 40 US dollars, which we tried to make uh, really affordable, but if that is a stretch for anyone, please just contact us individually and we will um, uh, do what we can. And the keynote is going to be then with the author of that book is going with to be Whitney on Phillip at, at on noon Eastern one. Stand, uh, one Eastern Standard Time on uh, Friday. Okay. I am. Um, I actually, if I if I try to find the website, my computer is going to freeze. So I, but I wrote the like. Um, Here I the, can probably get it. It's if you go to northeastmedialit.com, you'll you'll get there. And I wrote that in the in the okay. chat. I wanted to share at the end as well, like um, while we are wrapping up, it's um, to the hour right now. 
I want to say thank you uh, to Pam and to Michelle to, to running the show today. It was a great conversation. Many thanks for that. And I think it's it's very nice to have the conversation just before the conference to get ready and to, to warm up and have an aperitif before the meeting uh, and <laughs> yes. the conference. So I really like that. Uh, yeah, so to anybody, feel free to have ideas, uh, any articles that can serve you in any kind of same context uh, to share and to, to speak up. Uh, we really like that, Sam and myself. Uh, so don't hesitate, don't be shy. We're putting also, I'm putting into the chat box the link to the media club. Um, so the next media club is gonna take place in December, I think the first Monday in December. And I'm not sure if I know exactly what it stands for, but me, Sam, she might actually say IRL online Sam, can you say something about that or is that something? Yeah, uh, so um, Wes Fryer is going to join us um, and host a conversation about, uh, yeah, whatever that is. I'll be honest, I don't know what it is yet. I haven't <laughs> consumed it, okay. um, but uh, we're really happy to have it on the schedule <laughs> and we've got things lined up through February or March. So that's really exciting, but please host something after that. Yes. <laughs> So that's all about it. Thank you all for being a part of this. It's been great. It's been very helpful. Thank Many you. Things. And Pam and Michelle, you guys have so much going on right now. Thank you so much for adding this in. And yeah, uh, looking forward to seeing everyone at the conference. Yes. Thank you, Pam and Michelle. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you everybody. See you on the Bye. weekend for the conference. Yay. Have a nice one. <laughs> bizu, bizu. There we go. Bye. That was a good conversation, right? Fred, what happened to you? You're unmuted. <laughs>